Welcome to The Inevitable, a podcast by Motor Trend. Hi there, and welcome to this week's episode of The Inevitable. This is the Motor Trend Podcast, vodcast, where we talk about the future of the automobile, the future of mobility. Where are we going? How are we going to get there? I'm Johnny Lieberman. This is Ed Lowe. Hello. And we have a special message for you from our sponsor. The Inevitable Vodcast is brought to you by the all-electric Nissan Aria, inspired by the future, designed for the now. And right now, we're going to talk about... Designing the future. Designing the future... <laughs> <laughs> with uh, a gentleman from one of the world's largest architectural firms, Gensler. Uh, shout out to my boy, Bert DiViterbo, who works with this guy. Uh, Bert and I are friends, mutual friends, friends of friends from a long time ago. And uh, he went to Berkeley uh, Architecture School and now works for this company, which is absolutely massive, which we'll get into. But before that, I do mm-hmm. want to talk a little bit about the question of the episode. Uh, you might have seen an Instagram, a social teaser where we talked about doing one of the first questions of the episode with a guy named Declan. It was great. He replied on Instagram. We're going to send him some swag. It's awesome. Um, one of the questions that came out of that is, snicker, snicker, throwing some shade. Uh, yeah, you guys might want to rethink this now that sales of EVs are slowing down. I'm just going to take that question and not address uh, the person by name because they don't deserve to get swag, Uh, but also because a lot of people are throwing around this narrative that, oh, my God, the sky is falling. EVs are no longer inevitable. And I just want to, like, squash that rumor right now. So let's just be clear, okay? 2023, more EVs were sold in the United States than ever before. We crested over a million Okay. Yep. More, e- like five times as many were sold in 2023 as like in 2016. Okay. What has slowed is the the sales growth has slowed a little bit. Okay. The sky is falling. If you read any of the business papers, any of the uh, snarky automotive uh, websites. Yes, the sale, save the manual guys are very excited about very this. Very excited. Even though manuals are 1%, EVs were 10%. Right. Yeah. Then the truth is, is yes. Look, first of all, end of the day, Johnny and I don't care. The The podcast, the podcast is called The Inevitable. It wasn't called It's Gonna Be Easy or It's Happening <laughs> Tomorrow, right? Like, otherwise, why would we do it, right? The point is, is, is that it's going to take a long time. It's going to eventually happen. And we know from the start, we knew, we're not, we're, and we're not like, Brainiac geniuses about this. Everybody knew it's going to be hard. Everybody knew there's going to be infrastructure problems. Everybody knew like a lot of manufacturers don't have solid product plans. A lot of people are going to be grumbly and upset about it. That's why we're here. That's why yeah. we're here talking about we're, it. We're covering the change. We're rather, covering rather, the change rather than like you know um, 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 you know doing the change ourselves. We're just covering it. Right. We're and we're not really trying to ram any of this down your throat. Well, I mean, kind of. It's kind of fun. A little. <laughs> well, a little bit. But the point that I'd like to make, though, is that we still, it is inevitable. It's going to happen. I think there's definitely up for debate how much, how fast, and what I, percentage. And I would say the, the, the other point is, like, <clears throat> despite what many Americans think, we are a very small part of the world. Yes. And the rest of the world, especially the biggest country in the world in terms of population, China, um, they've made the change. They are done with internal combustion. And... Um, the, like it is inevitable. Like, like EVs are are they're gonna happen. It's gonna be right. the dominant mode of transportation. Right. And um, you know, Ed, you, we were talking before the show started. You know, if uh, you know Trump gets election back year. in right. uh, and undoes the uh, infrastructure bill, like, oh, are we going backwards? And, you know, and again, like it's just America's going backwards while the rest of the uh, humanity goes forward. It'd be a, a giant horrible mistake to undo Not, the infrastructure bill. I don't want to politicize it too much, but we are in an elec- well, we we are in an election year and the the point the the bigger point is is that it doesn't really it doesn't matter how you personally feel about EVs versus internal combustion. The point is about sort of global competitiveness and the greatest the greatest thing about the United States is that we're a democracy, liberal democracy. One of our biggest problems though is that we we turn over a lot of our leaders on a kind of a, a relatively rapid pace, right? right. Uh, Xi Jinping has been in power for 20-something tw- years. 
uh, Putin will be in charge for probably <laughs> yeah. 30 years, right? We're changing presidents like most people change their yeah. underpants. Th- that said, Putin being in power is you know, objectively a bad thing. But, yes. but go ahead, I'm just, continue. I, I'm <laughs> just saying, yeah. like, we we need to play the long game here on EVs, and we need to think about battery cell production. We need to think about every part of the production of the, the, the mining, the refining, of everything that goes into them, as well as every other part of, the, of this value chain. And that's it. I'm going to get off the soapbox. Because well, no, but you had a better point, which was that, you know, what, what you know, America, what, what, one of the many things that makes us great uh, is, like, leaders in technology. And if we, like, oh, yeah. turn our backs on this insane emerging trend, which is going to redefine how humans move around the world, like, we're giving up our leadership role, which is crazy, all, stupid. All of the current leading battery technologies were invented in the United States. Most of them were actually invented in Texas. Yeah. I believe that, and right? We, and we and gave now, them away. China leads all of the production and manufacturing, and they're keeping all that stuff secret, and we have to reverse engineer what they're doing. That's yeah. insane. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. So, but we, we, up, we had the lead, and we turned our back on it. I mean, yeah. we did, the market wasn't ready yet, but but yeah, it, it's... it's um, it, EV1. We had a lead on all this stuff, right? <laughs> so, yeah. okay. We're way over our skis here. Let's bring it back <laughs> to calmer... Saner, hey, look, the world's changing radically. There's a book about it by an architecture firm. Right. <laughs> Let's look towards the future utopias with a guy uh, from Gensler, the world's largest architectural and design firm. Uh, also one of the most profitable, I think somewhere in the order of billions, two billions. Uh, uh, I, could, I could tell you exactly. Yeah. They have a nice chart in this book. Massive. Yeah. Huge, yeah. If you are have a pulse, you've probably walked through a Gensler-designed space. Okay, They've done everything from Gap stores to Apple stores. A lot of the big airports in the world that you've probably, you may have flown yeah, through. Yeah, I mean, JFK, SFO. Yes. Uh, amazing, amazing thinking. Parts of LAX. From a gentleman who is based here, and he's the uh, principal, one of the principals at Gensler, means he's a partner, and he leads the future mobility practice area for Gensler, and his name is... Dylan Jones. Dylan Jones, and we're going to welcome him to the show. All righty, Dylan Jones from Gensler, thank you so much for making the trek out here. Of course. Real quick, I think we might have butchered in the intro, but could you just give us the the... Elevator pitch on Gensler. Yeah, absolutely. And first off, thank you guys so much. I'm oh. thrilled to be here. Oh, today. thanks for coming. So, so Gensler is um, an international design firm. We were, we were born here in California just over 50 years ago, and we've um, you know, built it on the backs of an incredibly strong culture, built an employee-owned firm that spans the globe now. We've got about 55 offices and counting. That might even be... Um, there might be a few more now that I'm not aware of yet. Um, <laughs> and we, we practice across about 33 different industry um, industries that we group within four sectors. There's a city sector, you know, aviation, cities, urban design, mobility and transportation. Um, there's a health sector, hospitals and um, sciences, health sciences. There's a workplace sector. It's quite large, you know, that, that looks at, you know, offices, all different across all different kinds of industries. And then finally, a lifestyle sector, which would include Sports, retail, etc. Okay, you're being incredibly so, modest because Gensler. My understanding is Gensler is also like the largest architecture firm in the world. And well, well, what I mean, what we're proud of is that we're the most influential designers in the world, and we're really improving the human condition um, through this kind of laser focus on experience. Like, how do we experience the places that we inhabit? You know, where do we live, work, and play? And and how does the design of those spaces improve lives? I mean, that's what's really important to us. Um, like I said, we've got an incredibly healthy culture, and that's led to a certain amount of scale. And we, um, you know, we really want to leverage that scale to, again, improve lives, like right down to the at the human scale. Can you? Can so, you, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, can you give us a couple of examples that maybe the um, we have an audience that's primarily North American based, mostly coastal. But is there anything that you could point to where they're like, oh, yeah, like, oh, if you didn't know this, you you are, that's a Gensler space. Well, if you've gone through some of the great airport terminals in the country, you know, SFO, you know, some of the terminals at LAX, um, at JFK, you've you've experienced some of our work, you know, some of the, the terminals where you land and you say, well, I think I'm going to get a bite here before I go into the city. Um, you know, we've really brought a kind of a hospitality approach to those spaces. Um, if you cat, caught a game at LAFC or... Other great stadiums in the country, some of those, you know, are our work. 
a lot of people work in spaces we've designed, especially in in you know the tech and media and legal professions. Uh, f- face. Facebook headquarters, right? I think. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Airbnb headquarters. Yeah, in, I mean, Nvidia headquarters. Uh, Nvidia, we're very proud of the work um, we've done with Nvidia. It's recently been featured in the Wall Street Journal, and you know, it's it's incredible. The space is incredible, and the way we used AI and leveraged AI to to really drill into design and design impact has been impressive. You All right, a, let's. Have let's you bought uh, an Apple device in the last uh, uh, ever? Ever, it's, yeah. It's the, the retail stores? Let's yeah. pivot real quick to cars. Not real quick. Let's pivot to cars. Well, and I have a, I have a big pivot. question, hard pivot. How much did the automobile screw up American cities, in your opinion? <laughs> Well, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that they screwed up the American city at all. I would say that the automobile um, has been a really transformative component. Okay, or positively. change American cities. Yeah. Yeah, and and when we think of it, I mean, let me just back up for a second. So, yeah. so when we think about mobility, I mean, I know you guys, you guys are car guys, right? And you're thinking about the vehicles, and you talk a lot about the vehicles. We are, but we also spend a lot of time thinking about, you know, uh, electric helicopters and and electric yeah, bicycles. You and, do a little bit. Oh, I spend a lot of time. I know you do. It's yeah. weird. <laughs> so, so from our perspective, the way we're thinking about it is we're thinking about kind of mobility as a kind of a component to city making and mobility and the way we move is a force, like it's a shaping force of cities. And to get into it, we had to develop a really simple model of mobility, um, which, so, which allows us to break down mobility by a series of modes. Like we talk about automobility or bike mobility or airplanes, et cetera. These are all modes and every mode has got a vehicle, a path and an experience. And it, it's really important and a simple way of looking at it, but it allows us to untangle the system, the system, the way in which you have to think about these things as systems and how they're interrelated. So if you talk about an automobile, for example, it's always got a roadway associated with it. And the automobile is typically privately owned. It's developed by private companies. They're very technologically current. Um, they meet different market sectors. Um, but the But the path or the roadway um, is publicly owned and it's shared and it's low tech and, you know, kind of dumb, but but it's got a function and it's got it like they're interdependent. And then there's the experience, whether you're in the car and enjoying the ride of your, you know, whatever that car might be, that model might be, maybe the top's down. Or if you're on the side of the road, like trying not to get hit while you cross the street or, you know, breathing the fumes, what have you. So, So I think those three things allow us to break down mobility into digestible parts. Well, like, I know, like, you know, I know roads have, you know, been around forever, you know, the Roman mm-hmm. Empire built more roads than mm-hmm. are in North America, et cetera. But like, I've uh, got your awesome book, uh, Design for, this is the Gensler book, Design for a Radically Changing World, showing it to the camera. Um, and it was, you know, a couple of salient points that, you know, I've known, but were in the book on the chapter 10 about mobility. You know, cars are used 5% of the time. 95% mm-hmm. of the time, they just have to sit somewhere. And so therefore, 14% of cities uh, are just dedicated to housing cars, mm-hmm. you know? So it's like, it's, it's as you were saying, you know, they're very transformative. There's a, there's something that cars do to physical spaces. That's right. Yeah. And you can see it. I mean, you started off asking about the North American cities. If you look at the figure ground maps of cities around the world, and you look at a, you know, like a Noli map of Rome, you might have seen before, figure ground. The kind of imprint of that city is very much a reflection of the mobility systems that were in play. If you look at a, you know, Cairo or Athens, ancient cities, it's like rabbit warrens of footpaths. Yeah. You know, and then you you get into the more kind of um, middle age cities or the the post Renaissance cities. You know, they're they're kind of horse drawn, you know, the distances get a little different or the, right. the, the early, you know, the 1800s, the rail cities, things like that. Um, the U S predominantly is built up around the automobile as a mobility piece, not entirely, but it's been kind of, it's been the adrenaline in the veins of our cities. And so again, when you look at those figure grounds, they look very different. Now, you know, if you walk the streets of LA and then you walk the streets of Athens, right. feels like a very different experience, very much because of the kind of logic of those systems right 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 so uh, this is well i was going to go with that so so you know going forward with you know we we know the industry is changing we know micro mobility or that last mile is going to change pretty radically we know like robo tax you guys talk a lot about robo taxis Mm -hmm. full autonomous vehicles uh we know that's coming like like how does that change 
uh, what you do? Like, how does that change city design, building design, work design, stadium design, et cetera, et cetera? Well, to answer that, let me just back up yeah, a second. Yeah. I'm kind of putting down some basic understanding here. So if you think about the history of mobility from our perspective, it's like, I think we've had two solid ages of mobility and we're probably entering a third. The first being the natural age where like every, any which way you wanted to move around the planet, it was either because it was wind was blowing you or you were carrying, you know, your own two feet or a horse was pulling you or maybe you were going up in a hot air balloon. I think interestingly enough, and it might be 1781, but the first hot air balloon went up in the same Paris, year the yeah. steam engine was invented. Right, right, So right. we moved into this kind of um, the, the kind of locomotion age of mobility. Harnessing wind and water, yeah. So we got – well, we got beyond that. So we started to harness like energy – like we started to – bring in like steam engines and internal combustion engines and, you know, electric, you know, motors and things like that to power mobility. And, and it opened up like a fourth domain. So it started water, um, land and air. And then now space is like that fourth domain of mobility. And I think what's really interesting about that is we might be entering a third age, which might be the autonomous age where up until this point or, you know, or recently anyway, you've always needed a human being somewhere in the equation. Right. And now we're getting to an age where you don't necessarily need that human being as the kind of pilot in that kind of mobility construct, right. which is a whole new age. So you ask about how that's changing cities. We're not sure yet. We're really not sure. And I think, you know, a car is still a car, whether you drive it or somebody else drives it. Um, we worry about congestion. You know, the average occupancy of a vehicle today theoretically cannot be less than one. But in an autonomous age, if the average occupancy of an automobile is 0.8, then we might have many more cars on the road. Right. Sure. sure. Right. Now, there's the psychology of it, too, which is really interesting. Right now, when you are out there on the street and you want to cross the street, you've got a subject to subject relationship with the people driving cars. So you think about it and you look and you make eye contact and that person's texting. I don't know if I trust them or I can see them. We're making that, that, that moment. It happens in an instant. And, and you also have like this kind of ingrained, you, you know, you've grown up as a civil human being and it's like, well, you go first. No, you go first. Right, right? Let me right, let right, you buy. Right, right. In the future, if your relationship is with an object, the question is, is are you as polite? And also if you know that object's going to stop because it's programmed to do so, how you does, hope, you hope. Right, right. So how does that change the, so, so it's like yeah. the dance of yeah. humans on our streets Interesting. changes quite a bit, Right. which, right, right, which right. is fascinating. So right. if, I, if I can just interject here really quick and just provide a little bit more context um, to what Johnny brought up, but what Dylan is explaining, we spent a lot of time on this podcast talking about first EVs and lately software-defined vehicles, SDVs. And when we, we came up and tried to popularize this term, which is still in its infancy across the industry. Yeah, it needs a better term, but yeah. Well, the other terms, one of the other terms, two of the terms, are the, the, the same term, it's just an acronym that's just spelled differently depending on which one you chose. And we, when we chose the third option, SDV, it's CASE or ACES, right, which is Connected, Autonomous, Shared, Electric, or aces just invert the letters, That's right? That's also terrible. Mm -hmm. But yeah, okay, I get it. Well, this is the hey, if it's it's <laughs> terrible because it became yeah. it could be it was either BCG or McKinsey or one of those guys, management consultant firms that came up with this. And yeah, it, that's the construct, right? right? That all vehicles are going to be connected, autonomous, shared, and electric. We've spent a lot of time talking about a little bit about connected, a little mostly about electric, a little bit about shared, but we're still punt we keep punting on autonomous because of all the recent screw ups with all the car companies, but yeah. it was very, Johnny brought it up, started there, uh, well, sort of, but it's it's a big feature in Gensler's book about in, about the future of mobility, that autonomous is gonna be this game changer. It is going to be the thing that, um, you know, to the point of which 14% of, of cities are devoted it was to parking structures. 14 or 11, I can look it up, but, but yeah. just, just parking vehicles, just the, land yes. use, yeah, is, yeah. which is a lot. Well, <laughs> imagine, yeah. imagine yeah, yeah. if the cars, don't ever need to be parked or they drop you off at the supermarket and then go and circle around the block until you're done or do something or else, go pick yeah. up somebody and make money to help you buy those groceries. That's kind of what we're talking about. And which leads me to my next question for you, Dylan, which is, you know, I, I've, I always want to ask the experts, Hey, when is this future actually coming? I don't think that's, that's really in your purview, but how much of 
what Gensler does. How much of it is necessarily a reaction though to the technology, right? Like you can't you can't build new cities with fewer parking structures or nicer or more more uh, safer, more autonomous vehicle friendly streets until the the that the technology arrives, right? Well, yes and no. I mean, many of our clients that are building buildings, you know, buildings take years to gestate. And sometimes when you need to, you know, rezone parts of the city to even allow those buildings, it can take decades. Really large buildings, large sites, you know, big master planning efforts that we're involved in, you know, these are generational projects. And our clients and the, you know, the investors and the communities that want to see these, com um, these places evolve have to look out years in advance. Now, like decades? Even decades. Now, I'll give you an example. Like, let's say... You're, let's say you're rezoning a whole kind of piece of the city, and it's going to take decades to fully build out. You know, right now, if you want to build, let's just use an, an office building as an example. If you want to build an office building, you're really building two buildings. You're building an office building, and you're building a parking garage. Right. And the parking garage is designed to store gas cans. Yep. Right? So the automobiles, what, what we find so fascinating about the electric revolution is the automobile is moving from an ecosystem of, you know, oil wells and refineries and gas cans and lawnmowers to an ecosystem of consumer electronics and refrigerators and phones and these things but also, that... But also like massive processing power and, you know... Matt, data. And yeah, bringing yeah, energy right. that can be used by other things. That's things right. Like, like just, just to underline it, like what you said about the, the hot air balloon and the train, right? You're, right. You're, so what, what I, I said, we're harnessing wind and uh, uh, water. What I meant was using, uh, you know, fire to control wind and water for the that's first right. time. That's... And that's really what an internal combustion car is. Yeah. Uh, you know, whereas like what an EV represents, you're bringing this massive battery in mm -hmm. that, you know, can, the energy can go to the building, the processing power can, that's can right. go to the building. It can, you know what I mean? It can actually connect. That's right. So in the future, you know, if I own an EV, it's, is it, is it a car or is it my energy and data wallet? Right. And when I go to work, do I plug in and sell back the excess energy I've collected off my roof to the building? Is right. the building actually powered by me? Like, you know, am I parking here and exchanging energy with you guys yeah. outside this building because right. I got a little extra and you or, need a or, little bit yeah, more? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. That's, that's right. the cool thing is like, hey, can, instead of can I borrow yeah. 20 bucks, like can I borrow 20 kilowatts? Exactly. Yeah. So it's like energy becomes almost like um, a currency, right. you know, and it's it's your your automobile becomes like a banking mechanism in that from that perspective. But what I think is, uh, something else that's worth putting on the table is, again, we we have a really strong understanding of where cars live in our life, you know, keep them in the garage and don't turn them on when you're in the garage, you know, with your car, right? Like we understand <laughs> right. yeah, that yeah, implicitly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. If an EV though is like your cell phone, it blurs the boundaries between what's inside, what's outside, you know, where the cars live in our life and how close they can get in. I mean, you know, we love our cars. You know, they're, they're these incredible like technology, energy, um, entertainment platforms. You know, can we, instead of building the office building and the garage, build one building and integrate those two, you know, place typologies, automobility and architecture as, as something that's more kind of integrated and uniform. I, I love that this, I love this. I want to talk about this idea, but I want to stop you right there because mm -hmm. we love our cars now. We love our cars because they're beautiful and they're sexy and they make this noise and they got Coke bottle curves. But a lot of people who deign to listen to us, a lot of our <laughs> gas-loving, EV-hating friends will be like, I don't think I'm going to love the car of the future. It's going to be an appliance. You keep telling me it's going to be like a smartphone on wheels. Mm -hmm. it, you got this Cybertruck thing. It looks like a stainless They're steel refrigerator. They're telling you this by typing on their smartphone, by the way. But right. Go ahead. But, you know, <laughs> the, you got this yeah, Cybertruck. Yeah. Looks like a, a, my refrigerator. Are we going – does that equate, like, will – you know, in the Gensler design of the future, are cars more commodified? Are they end up like, hey, it's hey, it's just this thing. It's a pod. It drives you. It's made by Apple or whoever. It's white, you know, and it's and now I mean, somebody listening to me like, are you telling me I'm going to like pull up, pull my my car into my office and just sit there and work like or, or I step out and sit in like some pod next to it? Like, why would I even leave the house? 
I don't know. Is, does any of that resonate? Yeah, no, they're, they're all great questions. I mean, I think, I think one of the things we're seeing in all of our mobility products across all modes is a lot more differentiation. I mean, I think when I was a kid, you know, if you wanted to buy a bicycle, you could either buy like a BMX bike or a typical three-speed or, you know, a 10-speed or was, an upright. There was two bikes, and then the mountain bike came out. And then the mountain bike came out. <laughs> and yeah. it's like the variation we have in any mode is just getting more and more intense. And I, you know, uh, car makers have a tough world right now because they used to be able to take advantage of scale. And now they have to contend with differentiation in two ways. It's like, is it going to be hydrogen? Is it going to be electric? Is it going to be internal combustion? I have to build three platforms. So I can't yeah. take advantage of those economies of scale. But they're also contending with the fact that every city is developing specific regulations or country specific regulations. So instead of just building one model, they can ship everywhere. They've got a, you know, so it, it's a really complex system. And so I do think there's always going to be a place for somebody who wants to restore an old Stanley steamer and drive it around or, you know, like a 1969 muscle car or something. There's always going to be a place for that, except if we get into the autonomous revolution and we get enough data and it becomes clear that they're much safer than human-driven cars, drivers might become the smokers of the future. They might be socially shunned Whoa, because of the dangerous behavior. Oh, yeah. Like, oh, you drove to work today? My kid's out there. How dare you? <laughs> you know, like that. Uh, that's, that's, that's a, I know that's I, a fear for a lot of people. It should be because yeah. I think it's, you know, it's probably not tomorrow or next year, but it's coming. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the, the, you, you talked about like what people think in terms of autonomous vehicles, like, oh, it seemed imminent, but maybe it's not. Inevitable? And, Inevitable? Maybe. Inevitable, Bing. And, but then maybe it's not. But I can tell God. you that, that you know, we were hired at Gensler. We do a lot of design research, and we were hired by a confidential client to go deep on autonomous vehicles. And at the, at the time, I was thinking, well, why do they want to look at this? You know, it's kind of on the outs. There's a lot in the mobility space that's more interesting. It didn't take long to be in that research effort that I realized we weren't really studying autonomous vehicles and mobility. We were, we were exploring artificial intelligence. So this was before ChatGBT came out, but all of the cutting edge machine learning that was happening in the world was to solve the kind of edge cases that exist in the autonomous vehicle world. So the bleeding edge AI programs that we're hearing so much about now are being developed or were being developed to deal with these challenges that we see right. in the world where it's like, it's a bazillion and one chance, but it seems to happen all the time on the on our roads. Sure, sure, sure. Well, sure. you're speaking specifically, I think, in the autonomous driving uh, situation. Situation is the in city, the low speed in in the high density urban situation, right? Which is why a lot of the car companies have now said we're just going to focus on like yeah, level three, level, super cruise, uh, blue cruise. In other words, freeways where there's freeways. no there's yeah, no but pedestrians. they're on the freeways too. Like uh, there were some interesting edge cases out there. It's like the autonomous car that's sitting behind the chromed oil oh, yeah. tanker, right, right, right. you know, seeing the reflection of the world. Right. So it and slams on the brakes because it's going to hit itself. Yeah, yeah, there's plenty of edge cases on the freeways yeah. too. There's just, it, it it might be that there's, it's just a different frequency or something. Yeah, fewer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. But it's coming and it's coming incrementally like you say. It's, you know, we're at level three under 40 miles per hour or whatever. But, you know, I we're seeing it in closed systems like farming, you know. Yes, Like absolutely. you can buy an autonomous John Deere, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And they're right? farmers love them. And they, they love they, them. They and if the you work. don't have yeah. farmers all over the world sitting behind tractors, <laughs> think about the innovations to our food supply. Right, You know, right, like right. again, like how do we improve, you know, the lives of people around the world? It's like these these kinds of systems. And I think... You know, so it is coming, and I do think it's we're going to start collecting a lot of data, and it will change policy because of the perceptions on you know risk or risk and behavior. Right. right. So let me let me ask you this. So so as as first of all, um, I got, there's the this this is a wonderful book. I don't know why I'm trying to sell your book for you, but I really enjoy. Well, it's this not book. first of all. This book is the this is for like what is this book for? Yeah, like how, I, I, it was very generous of you guys to give it to us. But it, it's is it for is it like a leave behind for potential clients or is, you're not selling this? No, there's no there's no this is not. People well, th this was just recently published, you right. know, by Andy and Diane. Um, the two, you know, the top, our, your co-CEOs, right? Yeah, yeah they're, they're our co-chairs now. Co they've actually evolved to our co-chairs, and we have two new CEOs have stepped in that okay. they've been working with for many years. And I think this is for them and for our firm a way of putting out there um, 
design thinking around a number of large kind of meta topics, you know, mobility right. being one of them. Right, yeah. But but it's really about helping people focus on the relationship between design and placemaking or space spatial production and and our cities really and how how we can bring design to the forefront to again improve people's lives. Yeah, I, I just again it was a, I found it to be a very thought provoking book. Um, I read about half of it, but I lo- there was this thing sort of in the intro just talking about what you know design is, and I thought it was just great. It said like you know design you you look at like all these different factors, people, culture, blah 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 blah, uh, and that results in a product that performs twenty four seven over generations. And right. I thought that was like I've never had architecture for lack of a better term distilled down that way but it's mm-hmm. like yeah that's what it does you know and that's why yeah. people react to like I, I need to go to rome uh notre dame burned down and i care for some right. reason you know right. what i mean and like right, it's right. really it's still p- d- performing centuries later and i thought that was just really fascinating but um you mentioned the parking garage and i wanted to mm-hmm. get into some specifics about and i, I look there's a in the mobility chapter there's a part on chapter like how, 10 on how the uh, parking garage would change. And I right. thought it was fascinating where it's like, well, instead of, and you know, no one wants to hang out in a parking garage. It's like, you know, it's like deep throat, you know, Woodward and Bernstein, right. like skulking around in the dark. But like, right. what if you made it an inviting env- environment mm-hmm. and there's no, you know, exhaust being blown in your face? Right. And could you, could you talk about just like, you know, what the, what, what, what might change yeah, in, I, in the parking garage of the future? Yeah. I mean, I think it's a great question. I think, I think there's actually two questions in there. It's like, what happens to all the parking garages that are out there? You know, or gas stations, we're also... Um, yes, we, ga- yes. We yeah, did this yeah, great yeah. collaboration with BMW Design Works over the last few years looking at this kind of intersection of architecture and mobility. And we looked at parking garages and gas stations. I mean, there's 115,000 gas stations in the U.S. No, it was, it was higher. Oh, okay. it was, I, I underlined it was 175,000. Yeah, I mean, there, there's crazy. a lot, yeah, right? Yeah. And and they yeah. sit, if you think of where they are, they're at the corner of Maine and Maine and every community in a in a distributed web across and, and they weren't there in 1906 that's what everyone right. forgets there weren't any they weren't and any suddenly yeah so what do they all become i mean it it's easy to say oh they become charging stations in the future well not really because it's not really the best place to charge your car that it might not synergize in the same way so same with parking garages it's like we want to think about what we do with all our legacy assets all our legacy parking garages and then we also want to think about you know, what is the parking garage of the future? All right, so let's break it down. What happens to the legacy garages and then what would a future level th- uh, or third uh, era of mobility parking garage look like? Well, okay, let, I'm going to reverse it for oh, you. Yeah, I'm going to go, fine, go fine. for yeah, the yeah. future first, okay, because okay. it's a little little more fun and a little yeah, yeah. maybe <laughs> right. easier. I, I think if you if you start with the premise and, you know, let's let's just jump forward into the future a bit and we've solved some of the kind of challenges with lithium ion batteries and what, what do you call it? Runaway heat. Thermal events. Ther- yeah. Thermal events. And they're, it's, they're rare, it's, but it's all thermal solved. Runaway, let's, right? thermal let's, runaway. Let's solve. But, let's, but, let's go. Yeah, but, yeah. but, you know, they're, they're, they don't admit fumes. So the question is, is I, I, if I'm the client, I'm like, well, I don't build me that building. Just, just build me one. Let's, let's figure out and, or, and, or don't give me a storage building that doesn't make any money. Let's think about what we can do. So maybe the garage itself on the one hand, it could simply be a battery. Everybody comes in and plugs in and like in net sells energy back to the system, you know, but maybe you start to mix program in there. You know, you can do your yoga class while you're charging or, you know, there's a whole host of human programs and experiences that match the time it takes to charge your car. Mm -hmm. And we're looking pretty closely at all of those right now. Um, You know, you go to a gas station, you can buy a hot dog on a, on a stick or like a handy bar. (laughs) But if you got 30 minutes to kill, maybe you do a podcast or you, you know, you join a Zoom call or you, you know, do a yoga class or there's certain things that you can do that actually match that time and you start to think of it that way. Um, but then you need a different kind of spatial construct. So the garage might not be a garage at all in the way we understand it. It might be more when we design our buildings, we think about how the car enters the building or the electric device, what, you know, might be a micro mobility device or flying device, how does it get into the building? And and again, you know, you think about it, it's like right now we know where to put the retail down at the street level. Well, if people are coming in on the roof through an EV tall, maybe they want to where coffee. do we put the retail? Like yeah, so yeah, we yeah. have to turn the city upside down or turn the building upside down or 
think about the real estate dynamics slightly different. I just thought it was interesting in, in the book. It, it, it was said like you know the ramps themselves maybe go away. Yeah, may, maybe so, maybe it was built for three hundred cars, and it turns out because everyone's you know using robo taxis that you only need one hundred and fifty. So you pull the ramps out, suddenly okay. you double the ceiling space. And it's, you know, then it can become part of the office yep. building. You can work in yep. the garage. So we're designing a parking garage right now in Coral Gables for the city. Yeah. And yeah. it started off, well, how do we fit? And this used to be the equation. Like, we want to maximize the number of cars we can fit in per sure. square feet. You want to minimize the square foot per car. It's just simple economics. We've all dealt with that, yeah. <laughs> so we said, well, listen, what if, you know, you're on the Miracle Mile. you got a lot of retail people coming in to shop. What if you make it an all electric garage? And so you're attracting people driving Teslas and, you know, these first gen kind of electric vehicles. They got money to spend. EVs mm. are 20 to 40 percent more expensive right. than average so, car. Yep. Right. So they come in. So so we propose build in flat plates, more floor to floor. You're going to get less cars, but you're going to generate more income per per car. You're going to generate more outside the garage through what people are doing. You're going to have breakaway um, ramps. And what you can do in this all-electric garage is you can be flexible and you say, you know what, on the third floor, we're going to make that third floor, you know, a co-working space or a pop-up space for retail during a convention and and kind of move it away from being just a parking garage during that time. And, right. so, and, and part of that is, is fueled, uh, for lack of a better term, by the fact that you're getting – you know, noxious emissions out of an enclosed space. Exactly. So it's it's a, a space exactly. where only EVs are in. Let me let me exactly. ask you something yeah. related. Yeah. Have you have you studied or done much work with uh, EV charging networks? Have you looked at Tesla supercharger network? Because it's what's interesting to me in thinking about listening to you talk about the future of the gas station. I realize that the blueprint for all charging networks was essentially laid down by by Tesla. Yeah. By a supercharger network. And it's very much... And they just shoved them into a parking lot. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the design... <laughs> yeah. Exactly. The design of the of the charger is definitely elegant and also much copied. But it's literally like, hey, let's put them here, 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 like this. And it's really like, yeah, just just dump them at the end of a, of yeah, a parking it's, it's like stall. A, behind the parking block, yeah. All of this is going to need to change or more, more like can change as charging times, re, you know, max, you know, max recharge times go way down and... You know, to your point, you can theoretically do all of these other things. But is this? I keep like listening to this. I'm like, this sounds great for this garage and Coral Gables. But the we're seeing the technology advance pretty quickly, and it, you know, we're getting down to recharge times of, of yeah, inside, eighteen minutes, eighteen twenty, yeah. you know, tw- twenty minutes. Twelve, on, on, honestly, on on the big lucids, uh, on a on a good charger, like you can do like th- add three hundred miles in twelve minutes. I mean, it's and just like once crazy. it, when well, I had I had a car maker recently tell me he's like, oh, you know, I can't talk about the stuff in our Skunk Works division, but all I can say is imagine a car that you don't need to charge for a hundred thousand miles. And I was like, I don't know what that technology. Who is this? Is. <laughs> right, I love Bre- here. Yeah. Breaking news. <laughs> Hang on, I gotta yeah. get on Twitter for a moment. Yeah, just yeah. I, I was just like, wow. You know, I mean, I, blink you know, twice if it's Toyota. No, yeah, right. right, right. It's a hot take, but I, but. But I think it's a really good point. I mean, I you know, the EV adoption, a lot of people are talking about um, EV adoption rates are, are seem to be cooling down a little bit. You know, there was there was a rapid EV adoption and some folks yeah. are saying, oh, things are cooling down. I, I think one of the challenges, people talk about range anxiety. I think it's charging anxiety. Yep. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, yep. will there be a charger where I need it? Will yep. it be compatible? Yep. 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 Will it work? And by the way, that's changing. We should talk about this, like, you know, uh, Monday. Uh, mm-hmm. for, or Tesla opened up the supercharger network to Ford owners. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then it's going to be uh, every month. It's going to be, you know, yeah, g- by the GM time owners. you hear this, hopefully GM will have opened up theirs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? So like, yeah, there, guess what? There's 17,000 Tesla chargers just in North America. Uh, there's more being built. So yeah. it is a thing now. Um, but I mean, it's going to change so fast. Yeah. You know? And, and, and also like, yeah, the, I, I, I saw that where, you know, the, the EV growth was, you know, 40%. Now it's, it's only 30. <laughs> it's <laughs> the growth. Yeah. I don't, I, yeah, yeah. let's, let's, yeah, yeah. that's, that's, Table a, that that's this ongoing narrative that we, yeah, we yeah. need to combat because it's actually quite toxic, which we'll talk about in the intro. Mm. Um, which we, which <clears throat> we talked about in the intro. <laughs> <laughs> uh, le, le, uh, sorry, but, but I don't know if you can continue your thought. If not, I have a, I have a follow-up question. Well, just the last point is one thing we're doing is, um, you know, again, we're very interested in the human experience. So we're conducting research right now in collaboration with um, certain automakers and 
and others in the mobility space where we're diving into the experience at charging nodes, you know, and it, it comes down to basic human stuff. Like, can you walk your dog? Is there, do you is feel safe bathroom? going somewhere to go to the bathroom? Like, you know, what is it? But we're also looking at it because the market is looking for what are those programmatic synergies that really work with charging. I'll give you a little anecdotal story. There was a mall up in Malibu that had an anchor tenant that had gone out of business, you know, one of these big retail anchors, and they were they were wondering what to do in this space. And they said, well, it's got a lot of power. Let's put in a Tesla fast charging station there. The Tesla fast charging station drove more business into the main line of the mall than the anchor had been doing in decades. Yeah. So, you know, the broker was looking at their retail portfolio and saying, hey, this is like it's a new model of, right. of how to drive value into adjacent programs. So I think in, in our business, you know, as designers and architects, we're always trying to look for the connections between those unlikely kind of programs and scenarios and experiences so that we can make it work. You know, so it's not just this initial, okay, here's a charger at the back end of the building. It's actually a place where people enjoy going. In the future, it might be almost like the airline model. You know, if you if you fly United, you get access into United clubs if you're a certain kind of member. I th Personally, I think we might be seeing some of that. Mercedes is doing that right now. Yeah. The, the, the new Mercedes um, charging station. Yeah. It's going to have like a Mercedes way. style lounge that you get to hang out. Yeah. In. And yeah, it yeah, might yeah. be, it's, there might be some exclusivity to it. There might right. be, which has its own issues, but it might be something you buy into and it might connect to the local communities and it might give you flavor. But if you know you have that as a, as a benefit, as an owner, I think it would go a long way to reducing this kind of charge anxiety. It's literally yeah. what Tesla it, it's, had. I was going to say, we <laughs> talked about this back in 2013 when we, you know, when we first started playing with the Model mm -hmm. S and we were spending a lot of time just like trying to figure out what the supercharger station, and again, it was a parking lot, but what it was, was here's a bunch of people that mm -hmm. all bought a hundred thousand dollar experiment standing around looking at each other like, you're smart too. Good job. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So it really did yeah, right. create this community. And right. it's only started to crystallize in the last three to four uh, five years, how smart those people are as other EVs have come online and the charging experience has really sucked. Yeah, and, like, and, it, and that's, yeah. that, I mean, you know, it's yeah, we, we can talk about advantage. that all day, but yeah, but yeah, let's, advantage, yeah. Uh, I, we won't get off cars completely, but I do, I do want to just chat a little bit because you mentioned uh, uh, EVTOLs or yeah. a, a electric vertical takeoff and landing vehicles, basically flying cars and also e-bikes. Mm -hmm. So let's go top and the ground level and the and the, the stuff that frankly I don't think is going to happen. These e-bikes e are like it's, 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 it, it tries to be controversial. But. Such yeah. a pie in the sky. But e-bikes. Yeah. I, I you know, let's see. Well, well, let's 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 challenge you might be right. I mean, it might be pie in the sky, but I thought what was interesting Lying is pie Uber in the sky. put out a white paper in 2017. You guys yeah. might have read it. It's a, it was on their website for a while. And they, they dug into the data of people taking like Uber black trips yeah. from Orange County to LAX or, you know, the Hamptons to New York or, yeah. you know, these outlying regions to these nodes. And they looked at the numbers, like how many people are willing to pay $100, $150 to do a 45 minute, hour and a half trip, you know, 40 mile trip in these urban centers. And the numbers are pretty substantial. And they, they hypothesized, they said, you know, we think that if we could pack four people into a eVTOL and run that eVTOL back and forth 10 times in the time it takes to do one Uber black trip, the economies actually work out and people would do that. And, and if you think about it for somebody who commutes, for example, 45 minutes, 60 minutes a day, would they take an eVTOL every day to go to work? No, but would they on Friday afternoon when they wanted to get home to their kids, would they pay the extra money to do it? And we see it on the fringes now. Um, you know, JetBlue right now has a service where if you fly the business class or whatever in New York, you can, you know, take a helicopter from mm -hmm. some of the outlying regions or, or I think downtown Manhattan to the airport. Yep. Um, you're, you're seeing that kind of stuff on the edges. And we're also seeing a lot of innovation in the, and investment in the eVTOL space. Huge. Yeah. yeah huge I, don't, amounts huge. I, don't, I don't dispute any of that. Oh, what, I do just, what do you dispute? I just don't see how this can be accomplished at scale and get through all of the state, local, state, and federal regulation. All right, guys, Ed doesn't see it. <laughs> and then, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then, where, <laughs> who, what are the, what are the road rules going to be like for all of these vehicles taking off? I, I love, I love the pictures. I love the the design of what looks like a helipad or a cool like, uh, you know. Maybe all. our guest knows something. Well, I think you you got to remember a couple <laughs> things. One is it's not it's 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 not a. 
a, a supplement to the personal own vehicle. It's it's more of a, you know, it's a fringe component in a kind of a multimodal mobility construct. So it yeah, wouldn't be a micro, everywhere micro all airport. at once. Um, and we might not see it in the U.S. first. Um, we're doing a lot of work, you know, in other countries Korea right now. Korea and China. Korea, and like, Germany and, seems like they're pretty into it. Yeah. And they're working on it. I mean, the like, you know, the mm. FTA and NASA and all these smart people are looking at this stuff. And they're... I wouldn't discount it out of hand. I think I think it is coming. Ed, come Sorry. on. Um, no, <laughs> like uh, like we went to CES and I I, I went and saw the uh, I believe it's pronounced uh, Supernal or Supernal yep. yeah. Hyundai's. Uh, we designed that 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 uh, booth there. Oh, yeah. that was a good booth. Yeah, wow, it was okay. great. Hey, you guys are pretty good. Um, but you know, they didn't say it, but they basically said like all of our eggs are in the basket that we will have some sort of FAA approval sure. for our design in two thousand by the end of two thousand twenty five. Yeah. And the product will be online if that happens by two thousand twenty eight. They never said like we don't you know, because I, I kept saying, well what if the FAA says you gotta have two pilots? And they're yeah. like, well da, 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 da. but you know, they want the one pilot four passenger thing to be like stamped like, okay, that's yeah. enough for these, you know, hundred mile trips or whatever. Yeah. We're not I mean we're not seeing technology as being the limiter there. We're no. seeing Government for sure. Right. And in that case, I'd rather put my money on something that needed government support rather than technological support, if you know what I mean. Sure. Because, you know, people, somebody's going to figure it out. In another country, they're going to start doing it. People are going to experience it. They're going to want it. They're going to. I got a flying car you know. cover of Motor Trend from 1956. I like to show you, show you both. <laughs> I just want to yeah. say, but, but, you know, but, I love the, it. The, hey, the I technology love is here. I, lo I yeah. love I, I believe the it's your point. Optimism. Yeah. Yeah. I get okay. it. Motor Trend 75 I, I, this year. I don't think everybody's going to be using it. I just yeah. think it's going to be more available than it is now. And so future. what do you, what's different about a building or what's different about a city that uh, has uh, these flying chopper thingies uh, as opposed to today? Like what, what, what would the building, what would be different? Well, I think, I mean, the question is, is where would you locate them? You know, like what are the kind of major attractors like airports, major universities, you know, you know, concert sports venues, center, concert yeah. venues, like Dodger stadium, like, yeah. And, you know, or like urban cores, things like that. But again, get back to the vehicle path experience structure. What's amazing about air travel is the most expensive thing in any mobility construct is usually the path. Mm. And in air travel, like in shipping or boating, it's free path is free. It's <laughs> yeah. out there, right? It's right, already right, built. Right. It's already constructed. Like it's been given to us. So it's all about the vehicle and can you make the vehicle work and the policy and the regulations. So from that perspective, I always will put my money on that than something really kind of out there like a hyperloop system that requires a tremendous amount of yeah. Investment and I technology. Mean, look that at we what, have. like, you know, the, or California yeah. high speed rail. <clears throat> I was gonna say, yeah, like, our, what, do we, what do we have in the US? Zero meters of uh, high speed rail. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not well, even sure what a meter is, yeah. but we have zero of them, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So. Okay, so let's talk about the scourge of e-bikes. I mean, <laughs> uh, I, look, I live by the beach, so I, yeah, I see, yeah. and my, and it's really, it's, it's less of a joke. It's I see all these kids uh, oh, yeah. in flip flops and, and wheelies, <laughs> helmets that are not strapped, right? Hopping wheelies, With, like their three friends <laughs> riding on the front and the back. Yeah. Uh, like how has how has the rise of of bicycles that can go like thirty five miles an hour? How has that changed? Has that changed the way you know, Gensler approaches? Public spaces, buildings? Well, in a lot of our, you know, buildings, we're designing things like, you know, especially in the bigger buildings or in the campuses or in our in our city planning, we're, we're developing ideas and concepts for mobility hubs, mm -hmm. you know, that are much more, they're kind of like amenity spaces that allow you to fix your bike or charge your bike or park your bike, not necessarily in the basement, but it becomes part of the kind of hip amenity of a building. Um, when we use, you know, in some urban applications, we'll team with kind of mobility providers, you can have like share electric bikes as a way of driving down the demand or need for parking, which saves tremendous amount of money on the construction. So, you know, I think that what's great about um, e-bikes or, or e-mobility, micro-mobility generally is it, it expands the access shed of individuals. So, access shed? Yeah. So in what's planning term? terms, like it, it started in, in the world of like you know, trans, transit-oriented design and develop, when you're designing a train line and you have a station, you want to think about how many people are going to ride the train and it's a function of how close people are to the station. Like people will walk 20 minutes to transit. It's well-known, well-documented. 
Beyond that, yeah, they start to it starts to fall right, off a cliff, right? right. right? And so your mm-hmm. access shed can be measured by how far somebody can physically walk. But what's, I don't understand the term shed. Like not the like, noun shed, the verb shed. Like yeah, to, yeah, like like oh, an area, shed. like Got like, it. like, a, like think okay. of like a yes, yes, okay, yeah, sorry, like a zone, a region. Yes, okay. And um, what's so interesting about micro mobility as it relates to multi mobility is if you're building something like a rail line and you support protected bike lanes and, you know, micro, micro transit options, things like that, you're essentially extending the shed or the, the area around that station where you can realistically pick up passengers or allow those passengers to choose alternate forms of mobility. So they, they are no longer transit dependent, like I drive because that's my only option or I take the right, train because right. that's my only option. You give people choice in their systems. Like, well, you can drive, you want to drive, you love cars. You sure. Know, you so, can so kind of like bike. how any other city except for LA, you could choose to take a train to the airport. I know we'll be able to do that right, soon, but right, you know, right. now you have to get in a car to get to the airport. Well, you know. yeah. Let me um, okay. choice and systems yeah, choice. we see as good in building resilient communities mm-hmm. and cities. So it's important to have choice in the system. Important to have choice in the system. I, I wanna, I wanna. I gotcha just a little bit. He really uh, does. Here. He's the mobility curmudgeon over here. No, 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 no. Trying no, to be look, spicy so for some I've said this. I've said this before. You know, motor trail. It's not like we're 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 not absent an agenda here. As, but it'll surprise some of the the haters. Mm-hmm. We love cars. We want all cars to be great. We're definitely pro car. We are not yep. pedestrian trend. We're not bicycle trend. We're not scooter trend. We are like we could be. You've told trend. We're Go ahead. we're motor yeah. trend, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's it yeah, is yeah. primarily about about um, personal car ownership. Okay, flip through the book, read the chapter on mobility. Gensler, largest architectural firm, design firm in the world, multinational. You guys, you know, work with clients. You serve your clients' interests, mm-hmm. but you also definitely have a point of view on what future cities should look like. Mm-hmm. And the vibe I got from the book is that. Hey, you know what? Cities have kind of too many cars or too many lanes, or we should be getting back to a future where there's more of a, a human experience of some sort. And I think for the the diehard the car slash NRA nuts, like you'll take my car keys from my cold dead hands. Like what where where does <laughs> autonomously take them? Yes. It, it, yeah. It, yeah, then <laughs> yeah. layer in the yeah, autonomous yeah. portion on there. Yeah. So does Gensler have a position on what the ideal, what utopia the, the, the future utopia should look like and what the what the what ratio of yeah. privately owned vehicles or you know you know what I'm saying? Like Yeah, no, I know what you're saying. And I think I think just to be really clear, again, you know, having choice in the systems is good for everybody. Um if everybody is forced into cars I and mean, we've got a growing population, more people can afford cars, it doesn't do any good if you love cars if you're sitting in gridlock. Mm-hmm. So Ooh, good point. Right. Yeah. So it's like what we want on our st- for our streets and our cities is to have, you know, like a broad range of like equitable choice within that city. We're not, I don't think we're saying, or we're not saying cars are bad or people shouldn't drive cars. That's not it at all. It's that we want to think about how design can support the efficient use of our streets and our roadways to support like a broad range of users and user typologies so that whether you want to ride a bike or you drive a car you know, or a scooter, you want to walk, you've got a reasonable expectation to, you know, safety and enjoyment right. and health and all those things. It, so it's it's a balancing act. And I'm not saying everybody's always going to be happy and every location is slightly different than another. But I do think we always want to think about, um, you know, the range of options and the range of kind of people that that need different solutions for their own mobility needs, whether it's a senior citizen or a child or um, to that point, is that is that a an, an as yet to be built future state, or is it a return to something that we had? Like L.A. in particular used to be actually a great city of public transportation. We used to have the Pacific well, Line when we had no population. Yes, yeah, but yeah, early mm-hmm. days. But is it is it? It's and I, I hear what you're saying. It's that mix of having a great uh, bus system, a great light rail system, a, a subway. And a good mix of privately owned vehicles, but also the ability, if you want to use a bicycle, you can do it without getting killed. Right. So is that right. is yeah. that a, yeah, is yeah. that for most of this country a return to a past era of the '30s? No, 40s, I don't think or... it's necessarily a return to the past era. And th- this is something else people forget. I mean, cars. The, the the biggest innovation about cars was health. I mean, before cars, when everybody was in horses, horses and horse-drawn carriages in cities. I mean, 
if you really try to imagine that was like what that was like, I mean, there was horse manure everywhere. Who? Oh, two million would, gallons of horse urine a day in the streets. Yeah, in New I mean, York. it was a mess. Yeah, two million gallons a, a, day, a day. So these yeah. cars came <laughs> right. along and, they, and they cleaned, cleaned things yeah, yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. they were one of the greatest greening, you know, you know. But at the same time, if you, especially if you look at old videos of those streets in, in dense urban cores, you know, the streets were like communal social space. Right. And, you know, at some point they became more and more and more about, you know, space for automobiles, which is fine. And that's allowed a lot of like innovation and growth, et cetera. Again, I'm not saying automobiles are bad, but the question is, is how do we create a vibrant street that supports efficient and enjoyable automobile use, also safe pedestrian and healthy pedestrian environments and maybe protected lanes for that kind of we call it the third lane, you know, something that's not, it's faster than a pedestrian, but slower and lighter than a car. New York's doing that. They, they, yeah, they have, they like have a bike poor, lane, poorly. very poor. It's yeah, the most yeah, dangerous and, thing in the world. Yeah, yeah. And some places you go to some parts of the world and they do <laughs> yeah. it very well. You right. Know, you yeah. Land, Copenhagen yeah, or Amsterdam, Amsterdam or something. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, your question about like the future state, um, you know, is it a utopic future space? We do not have a vision for a utopic future. What we so have. So Gensler's not going to tell us how to live. No, okay. not. Not at all. Not at all. I think I, these these conversations are like engagements with communities, right? Right. And and it's like cities are churning and they're always evolving and churning. And and you're trying, what's the best way to do it? And and how do we incrementally move things forward? I mean, we have these street these paths that are for a wide range of people. So how do we best design those so they can maintain their relevance in the future? Okay. So wait, 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 wait. because when we talk about a lot of, again, some of the concepts in of the future, or at least in the, the short-term future, is this idea of bringing people back to the city. Cities have been mm -hmm. abandoned, some of that because of the car, long commutes, but also the move to suburbia. And Gensler has this role in, in making cities, everything you said, more enjoyable, return mm -hmm. returning this human the but, condition. But also people have returned to the cities. The cities have been growing in the U.S. where the other parts have been in population decline. Well... Yeah. Mm, so, no, LA, no, no, downtown's no, a little no, 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 no. Well, let, let's pause on city for a <laughs> yeah. second. I mean, the other thing about it is, is how do we define city and where is the city? I mean, it's easy to point to the big office towers and a That's core, what I mean. but, but I think that the cities are kind of, um, you know, these roving kind of organisms all around us. And, hmm. you know, one of the big modes that's evolved in the last 10 years is what we call virtual mobility. So we always go, we think about mobility as going from point A to point B. And if you ask yourself, why do you go to point B? It's always to consume an experience, whether that's to see your friend, to go to work, to go shopping, yeah. you know, even just to go out and get, you know, have a run or a drive or something. It's always but now we can start to import the experience from point B to point A in some cases. You know, we can meet, you know, we could have done this over a Zoom call. I'm glad we're doing it in person. It's richer. It's, it's, it's. More right. Vibrant. But like Peloton is a good example. Yeah. Right? Or like, like yeah. you know, people shop on Amazon or they, yeah. they, they work remotely or they learn remotely. So we've got this kind of virtual mobility as a, as a modal choice that people are using. They're saying, I don't want to get in my car today. I want to just, you know, Import. So, so what they're essentially doing is they're moving the location of the city to where they are. And so you're getting this kind of growth in these unlikely places where now all of a sudden that person's hanging out somewhere where they want to get a really good cappuccino, right. you know, or, you know, they want to have like other city or urban experiences where they are. So I think what we're seeing in our, in our post-technological age is the fragmentation of cities and not so much you know, like the center. So I think when we say, you know, and lots of people have, you know, there's a lively debate around all of this, but when we say we want to bring people back to cities, I think what we're really saying is we want to bring, bring people back to rich human experiences. Right. And they might be happening in right. unlikely places today. Okay. I had, a, I had a more practical question, so let me just rephrase it a different way, which is multi-unit dwellings, mm -hmm. EV charging. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. How does yeah, yeah. Hmm. this is a short term? This is this is a ten to fifteen year problem. I think we need to figure out, which is all these people who say they want to buy an EV but they live in an apartment. Yeah. What's the solution? I you know London did this great thing where they were installed. They put at the base of all the fancy London street lamps, like uh, uh two, whatever the voltage is over there mm -hmm. to charge. L, uh, you know, yeah. level two charge vehicles. Great. What do we got in the U.S.? What's what should we be doing? 
for people who live in apartment buildings? Well, I think that, you know, oftentimes the apartment buildings themselves, there's not much you can do with them. Like in, in the worst cases, they just don't have the electric infrastructure. They don't have the utility connections to support kind of mass EV charging within the building. There's a few things I think we can do in those communities is I think, you know, we can look at developing kind of mobility hubs like EV charging centers that aren't just, you know, specific to brands, but they're more, you know, generic. Mm -hmm. I think we can continue to advance our kind of like vehicle to vehicle charging capabilities, you know, the way to like create more fluidity in the, in the energy markets. Um, but a lot of these challenges are really tricky and sticky. Um, you know, a lot of them go back to the utility grids we have, you know, in the country. I mean, if everybody had an EV today, magically, we'd be in trouble. Like yeah. our electric grid would not support the transition of that much energy from fossil fuels to our electric grid. Overnight. Yeah, sort of. I mean, that it, it, it's actually, it, uh, people say that I, I've done a ton of digging into that. And mm -hmm. it, it would actually, would, in California at least, it would only have to, the residential grid would have to increase by 27%. And that, that's already happening 2% a year yeah, anyway. So but have you ever tried to do anything with the electric utility? Me? No, <laughs> never. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yes, okay. yes. I, I, tried, mean, I put solar I panels say, in. It was insane. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, there you well, go. Well, hang on. Let's, hang do, on. let's, you, let's you do, did three in a row. I, I know. It. We're going to do a lightning round. Oh, boy. So, yeah. Well, oh. I had a longer one, but I was going to say, could you talk a little bit about what you've been up to with BMW? That, that sounded really fascinating with uh, rethinking gas stations. Yeah, so BMW Design Works, which which originally was a design studio here in California that mm -hmm. I think, you know, they kept winning commissions with BMW. So BMW brought them into their broader umbrella. And um, so so they do a lot of work with them as a kind of a out in the market, um, you know, designer that's free to kind of play on the edges beyond BMW, do some great stuff. And so we, we've we known them for a long time. We actually designed their um, design studio out in Thousand Oaks decades ago. They've since moved to Culver City. Um, but anyway, we, we've been working with them for a few years to ask this question of like, in an electric construct or in a future construct, how do the worlds of automobility and architecture kind of collide or what do they look like? And we've looked at that through a series of place typologies. We, we, we've we memorialized that on a website. It's architecturexmobility.com. If you go to that website, you will find, you know, stories and interviews from us and the designers, but also renderings and videos of some of these place typologies we've been speculating around. And it has a lot to do with, you know, future parking garages and charging stations and kind of fluid nodes. And, you know, and the automobile too is becoming more somewhat domesticated in a sense. If you look at some of their designs and they're thinking about, you know, how does the home move into the automobile? And, you know, we did things like we mapped out the ecosystem of electronics and experience in a house versus the car and kind of mapped them and they, they kind of mirror each other, which is really interesting. And, you know, when you bring these things together, it's interesting. I mean, here's an interesting architecture, automobility, um, you know, item that not everybody knows, but the 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 garage in the in the single family home is arguably the most fertile grounds for innovation the country has ever seen rock and roll punk rock the tech industry all came out of the auto garage because it's a free space and it it's wasn't not designed you know it's okay let's design a space typology in the suburbs that's going to incubate a tech industry right right that wasn't right. the brief right you know right so, in Sunnyvale and Cupertino, they didn't right, think the, the right. whoever the home builder was, you know, punching out cookie cutter post-war homes, didn't think of that. But it's been fascinating working right, with their right. designers and bringing in our designers together and sharing kind of perspectives on timelines. Is this for generations? Is it for five years from now? What is this? And huh. thinking about that experiential piece. Okay. Sorry, that's not lightning. No, 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 no. no, no. no. We got, so here, so this is, I got, I only really got two lightning round questions. One is, can you dispel... Back to parking garages, we talk about this a fair amount. Um, the weight of EVs, if everything, to your point, if, every, if everybody had an EV today, does, does it provide some sort of existential threat to all parking garages that are currently built because they weren't designed to accommodate, you know, the, the idea is that all of EVs weigh, you know, 20 to 30 percent more. Mm -hmm. Not that you're going to be contest that, but I won't say anything. EVs are heavier than gas, except for vehicles. Ford trucks, right? Right, right. Um, 
<laughs> does he, does this is this anywhere any 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 truth to this at all that there's some sort of big potential collapse happening with? Mm, I, I look, I'm not a structural engineer, so I don't want to speak too specifically about okay. it. But generally speaking, in architecture, under unlike things like airplanes, where you have to design everything to like you know minimal tolerances. Yeah, you do a maximum. In architecture, there's like pretty heavy. I mean, what's interesting about parking garages, and it seems counterintuitive, but when you want to reposition a parking garage to something like, you know, a housing or, or some kind of human use, the challenge is, is that the design for the parking garage isn't designed to carry the loads like human loads, you know, like assembly space loads. Or, you know, if you tried to have a nightclub on a floor of a parking garage, it would, you know, be super bouncy and it wouldn't work. It'd be totally uncomfortable. And, you know, so I think I, I, I don't think that I've ever really heard in architecture, structural design circles, that that's some looming challenge. But again, don't, I'm not a structural okay. engineer. I don't want to. Good, good answer. I like it. Say too yeah. much about it. No, no. You said you had two. Go ahead. I don't, I don't have any lightning. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, this could be the last question then yeah. if you want it to be. Uh, I would like to leave our audience with a moment of, of Zen, which is mm. what city, what city or place or structure embodies like is the the currently like the encapsulation of all of this this great design thinking is there a place that we could go to we could jump on a plane and go to tomorrow that has a lot of these elements already or at least the foundation of them in terms of like man this is great place right, for so who does it better human interaction yeah. is it some place in china i bet it is it's like some no, mega, I, mega city you know, they built it, it's a great question i don't want to be a, like give you a disappointing answer but okay I wouldn't say that there is one utopic place. I mean, if you love bikes, you know, go to Amsterdam or Copenhagen or certain yeah. cities in China. Or if you love automobiles, you know, go to Germany or, you know, go to LA. Audubon or L.A. I mean, L.A. is number one for you cars. Know, and if yeah, you yeah. like, you know, I don't know, like there's there's different things that you might like. If you like snowmobiles, like, you know, <laughs> go, go to. So, right. so I don't think you can say there's there's one place that has everything. Um but, you know, just just to add quickly to this lightning round, it was interesting in listening to one of your recent podcasts you were talking, one of you were talking about the Countach in Montreal. That was me, and, yeah. And having that moment yeah, yeah, where yeah. you were just like, you know, I'll just share with you when I was a child, and I think children kind of have these moments like you did. When I was a child, um, my, my father took a sabbatical in Europe, and we landed in Paris, and I was about 10 years old, and this was the 1970s. My father was like, here's a metro map, and... I'm going to up your allowance to 10 French francs a week. Whoa. Like, go explore. Well, it went from like 50 cents to $2.50. Right. It's huge. Yeah, yeah, Biggest yeah. raise in yeah. my life. That's two And it was gets. like, yeah. here's this map. And I got this colorful map, you know, of Paris that was reduced to these simple colored lines and big dots. And I, Eiffel Tower, I can go there. I can go all these places. And it was, I think it was like the moment I had that you had when you saw that Countach. I had that when the city was opened up to me and I was like, let go and free in this, in this place. So it was like an instant where, you know, for me, that was utopic, right. but I wouldn't say you go to Paris now and you're going to see a utopic mobility. Concert. No, but I will, I will tell you though, coming from LA, like, yeah. and like, you know, I, when I went to New York for, you know, the first time as like an adult and I saw the subway map and I was mm. like, I remember my friend had a subway map shower curtain, Yeah, yeah. you know, and I'm like on the you know, toilet, excuse me, yeah. but like <laughs> so brilliant, like look, it's so colorful yeah. and like, there's the whole city. And yeah. then you go to London, you go to Paris and like, yeah. It just there's the whole thing mapped. I know what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. It's, like, it's very like <gasps> I've I've now gained knowledge, like, kind of like the Matrix. Like I'm downloading like yeah, the knowledge legible. of where to go and how to get there. And That's it's like right. A freedom thing. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Very cool. My childhood moment about maps and cities was learning that uh, roundabouts in uh, European cities, medieval European cities, were designed so you could put a cannon in the center and fire it down the road at invading armies. <laughs> and as a kid, I thought that was like the coolest. Well, thing. thanks, Ed. Yeah. Um, <laughs> one request: as you design um, these future cities, yeah. more roundabouts, less stoplights. Can you can you work on that for, well, for the U.S. I, I, again, autonomous vehicles? I could see an age where we don't need stoplights anymore. Yes. Like yes. if you have a vehicle to vehicle or vehicle to X, things, yeah, 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 yeah. World, uh, what are they, car to X, they you know, cars. Car to I mean, X. The, the real problem in mobility systems is when you come to a stop, mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter how fast your average speed is. If you're flying across the country or you're going up the road, it's those moments where you're stopping, landing, hard. You know, you're in line, <laughs> or you're, you know, it's that kind of, you know, those moments. So I, I think in a world where things can free flow amongst each other, 
you know, I, I think that's pretty utopic. Because I would love somebody to do a study, if you're listening out there, like how much health and environmental damage we do with red lights versus a roundabout. Like the idea of just you fully stopping a vehicle and they sit idling yeah. versus like, just go, just get on with it. Just go. If people could drive better and just do a roundabout. Bend, Oregon is great because it's got this Deschutes River. It runs through. It's kind of this mm-hmm. lazy river. And they've got all these roundabouts in downtown. Yep. And you yep. drive yep. around the town and you're kind of going slower, but you're never stopping. Yep. And you feel you've got this kind of lazy river feel. And it's great. It's great. I, I'm totally with you there. But you okay, did cool. answer the Thank question. You. Apparently Thank we can go to Deschutes, Oregon, <laughs> to, 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 to find the future state yeah, ben, of Bend, Oregon. Bend, there Oregon. you go. Sorry, yeah, ben, yeah. Bend, Oregon. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm drinking Deschutes beer. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Listen, cool. uh, yeah. we ran out of time a lot. Well, this is fast. Way too quick. Well, we sh- wish you had you on earlier when we were two hours. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> but Dylan, thank you so oh. much for coming on The Inevitable thing. Yeah, and thanks yeah. for the books. Um, like... And thank you for the books. I, it was a great book exchange. Really yeah. enjoyed it. And uh, <laughs> our book club. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah, we'd love to have you on again. If, if it works out, we can find, uh, you know, if you got something big and you want to unveil you know, yeah. we're happy to show up. And here. if you're listening and you're designing like, or you're building a, you know, a hospital or an airport or a, a stadium or a yep. city, you know, call Gensler. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Ask for yeah. Dylan. Absolutely. <laughs> We've got a growing, I mean, we're, you know, we use the term architectural, but we're, we're a design firm. Right. And we're designing a lot of things. And tomorrow we're going to be designing many more things that we're not designing today. And there's a huge world of mobility design out there that we're excited about growing into. So by all means, reach out. Great. Cool. Thank Thank you. you so much. Thank you. The Inevitable Vodcast, brought to you by the all-electric Nissan Aria. Inspired by the future, designed for the now.